very good evening uh, everyone and we welcome you all uh, for the webinar two of the series of webinars uh, hosted by faculty of dental sciences uh, university of peradeniya uh, sri lanka i am uh, dr sumudu madavela from faculty of uh, dental sciences today uh, we have one of the most popular cleft surgeons uh, in the country with us uh, dr parakrama vijaykon Dr. Parakram Vijaykon is currently attached to the Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery, uh, Faculty of Dental Sciences, uh, University of Peradeniya, Sri Lanka, and uh, carry out uh, du his duties as head of the department and chief cleft surgeon in the team. Um, he served the country as board certified specialist in oral and maxillofacial surgery for nearly 20 years. He was instrumental in uh, setting up the Smile Train project uh, in Sri Lanka and currently working in the capacity of director, Smile Train project, Sri Lanka. Figures speaks out his experience. He has carried out more than 3,000 cliff surgeries and that is uh, self-explanatory of the marvel of his touch on cleft. He made his valuable contribution to numerous academic forums nationally and uh, internationally. Also, he has co-authored uh, numerous texts, including books, chapters, and uh, research publications. With that introduction, uh, let me invite Dr. Parakram Vijayakorn to deliver his presentation. He'll be talking to us on uh, management of cleft lip and palate. Uh, over to you, sir. Thank you, Samudu. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening to all of you. Very sorry for the unexpected delay. Hold on. So can we share the screen, please? Hold on. Yes. We'll be starting. The, so actually, we are starting today the second lecture of the webinar series, as uh, just mentioned by Dr. Sumudu that is on uh, cleft lip and management of cleft lip and palate. And this is a very vast lecture which cannot be covered within one hour. I'll try my best to cover up all the aspect of the cleft, at least in a sort of point form. So to make the lecture more interesting, I have incorporated several MCQs during the lecture. So we will, so those are very simple uh, MCQs. So we will go through them as we proceed. So, so the question is, what is cleft lip and palate? A cleft is not a just a separation or split uh, from a normal fetal development. There is a certain amount of deficiencies of tissue and rotation. To make it summarize, is discontinuation, deficiency, or displacement of uh, tissues. So the displacement, deficiency, and the displacement uh, varies from patient to patient and it is second commonest birth defect in the whole body and the commonest of the head and neck region. On top of that, 20% of the patients may be associated with other malformations. It's stuck. Why is not moving? So we'll go, this one is not working. Yeah, it's working again, sir. Yeah. Can we, do, can we have our first MCQ just yes. to begin with? Yes, sir. Yes. So it's on the screen now. Yeah. So I'll give you, I think it's very simple question. 10 seconds, 20 seconds. Can we have the words come now? Yes, sir. Yes. So majority has got it correct. Okay, we move. Sir. Okay, sir. So please continue. So epidemiology. So the cliff flip and palate basically can be divided into two main groups. First group, they, those two groups are genetically completely different. First group, cliff flip, 
if though without cleft palate. The second group, isolated cleft palate. The first group, the difference, there's a difference between the ethnic groups in the population in the world can be divided into three broad groups of Mongolian, Caucasians, and Negroid, as you know. It's commonest in the Mongolian population. That is about two to three per thousand. In Caucasian, it's one in thousand. In Negroid, 0 0.3 per thousand. So the second part, it's more common in male. So most of you have got the answer correctly. Two to one, more common in male. And the isolated cliff palette, uh, genetically distinct from cleft lip and uh, lip or it or without cleft palate, and incident same among all ethnic groups. One in 2000, and it's more prominent in female. What are the problems a patient or the parents might face with the cleft uh, lip and palate? Firstly, the feeding and nutrition. Secondly, the facial aesthetics. Other defects, if syndromes, hearing, uh, speech dental problems, facial growth, and psychosocial problems associated with the cliff whip and palate involved in the parents as well. What are the problems at birth? Firstly, the identification of cliff palate can be missed if not looked carefully. And then identifying the syndromic patient is very important. Therefore, a neonatologist and a pediatrician should go through them thoroughly and if necessary, necessary reference has to be maintained. And then the feeding and nutrition. Usually most of the cleft babies with poor birth weight, they have difficulties in suckling and swallowing, which has to be addressed at that time as well. Then they may have breathing difficulties, identify them and manage it properly. And parents' psychological issues has to be addressed in depth because that if you don't address that problem properly, there may be a lot of uh, involvement and a lot of problems in managing the babies. Although the cleft are usually isolated condition, there are more than 3,300 syndromes known to be associated with the orofacial cleft. Cleft palate more likely to be syndromic than cleft lip and palate. So in examination, it should include a detailed family history, Thorough examination of the head, neck, and the extremities, and if necessary, investigation, including chromosomal testing, if there are some concerns. Can we have the MCQ one? Yes, sir. So those are very simple MCQ, so we will go through them very fast. So I'm launching the poll. Okay, can we have the answer? Uh, say answers are on the screen, sir. Yes, so I think you got it correctly. So as you all know, the cliff flip and palette are multifactorial in origin. All of you have got it correctly, 96%, that is very good. And the multifactorial, in a sense, it's a genetic factor and environmental factor. So genetic factor, mainly there are some genes involved in it. Genes are things which control the cell proliferation, cell patterning, extracellular communication, and differentiation. Clifting usually represent a genetically complex event. As we already mentioned, clifting of the lip and palate associated with more than 300 syndromes. So the etiology, there are certain genes has been identified to be a uh, causative factor for the cleft. PGF beta 3 gene expressed just prior to palate fusion, resulting in the isolation, isolated cleft palate. Second one, RF, IRF6 identified in autosomal dominant Vandewood syndrome. And there are three more examples. First one, Vandewood syndrome, IRF6, Tichocollins, TCOF1 gene. Then efforts, FGI, FR, 2G. So we will have a third uh, MCQ now, Sumudu. Okay, sir. Right. I'm launching the poll, sir. Yeah. Again, it's very simple question.
can you have the words kumbha so results on the screen sir yeah again yes it's again 87% got it correctly so the environmental agents involving in the cleft there are many firstly the infections viral infections basically like rubella and the medications like phenytoin sodium valparate methotrexate and cigarette smoking especially noted with the mothers of children with facial clefting and the excessive alcohol consumption folate deficiency a controversial issue and then this is a famous uh, diagram of environmental interaction between the environmental factors and the genetic factors so can you see my mouse actually moving so much yes can sir, we can see sir yeah okay so this on the left hand side as you see the environmental factors are prominently placed here and very mild input from the genetic factor so basically they are caused by the teratogens and with other anomalies they have the clefting with other anomalies but they do, do not resemble syndromes so this is a basically environmental or the in factors involved in the cleft the majority of them are interaction between the environmental as well as genetic factors so they are the isolated cleft which does not have, does not have any other abnormalities and the third category on your right side is a syndromes where the chromosomal aberrations are more prominent there you have your loads of syndromes pcf stickers apets which collins etc and this is the fourth threshold model for the liability for the cleft lip and palate here we have a males with a unilateral cleft lip and palate females with a unilateral cleft lip and palate males with a bilateral cleft lip and palate and then females with a bilateral cleft lip and palate this is the threshold for the cleft lip so firstly the males with unilateral cleft lip and palate married to a normal woman then the chances of getting a cleft child is minimal there next comes the females with unilateral cleft married to a normal a normal person and then he, she has a higher risk of having a child with a cleft similarly a person with a, a man with a bilateral cleft married to a normal woman has gained further with the risk goes further up and finally a female with a bilateral and palate married to a normal person has the highest risk of having a baby with a cleft lip and palate and in one of the common question the parents and the the people are asking what are the chances of getting a cleft lip and palate so the answer is in general population it's about 0.1 percent first degree relatives that is four percent that means if we have one child with the cleft you have another child with the cleft risk is about four percent when it goes to second degree it goes to 0.7 percent and third degree it goes to 0.3 percent so those are the important factors because as a clinicians we may have to answer the questions usually put forward to us by the parents and the caretakers now we will just move into the facial development in brief as you know the mid face basically comprises of three prominence frontonasal maxillary and the mandibular prominence the pink color is a frontonasal blue is designated for the maxillary and the mandibular is on yellow so what happens during the development middle part of that nose and the nose part nose and the lateral side is from the lateral nasal prominence so it's a frontal nasal prominence become lateral nasal prominence and the medial nasal prominence this part forms the filter and that part is the maxillary prominence so complete uh, complete unilateral cleft lip result from complete failure of fusion of medial nasal prominence and the maxillary prominence this is the medial nasal prominence and this is the maxillary prominence so failure to fusion that cause the complete unilateral cleft lip and palate you can see it in diagrammatic way and in real picture severity of the clefting varies from patient to patient and can be asymmetric as well so in this bilateral case is asymmetric and displaced the oblique cleft or naso ocular cleft result from failure of the union of the lateral nasal and the maxillary prominence so remember 
If the medial nasal prominence and the maxillary prominence, you get a unilateral cleft. But if the lateral nasal and the maxillary prominence, you get a facial cleft. This is the development of the palate. So during the seventh week of intrauterine life, this is the situation. The tongue is up in the mouth and the palatal shelves are vertically placed. And during the eighth week, the later part of the eighth week, those palatal shelves become horizontal. They, initially they are vertical, they become horizontal, migrate into midline and fuses and form in the palate. So this is what happens actually. And that happens in the end of the eight weeks of intrauterine life. So the cleft palate, partially or total lack of fusion of palatal shelves, it can give rise to a different many ways, but they can group into four groups. Firstly, defective growth of the palatal shelves. If they are not growing properly, they can't meet together. And then the failure of shelves to attain the horizontal position. Some conditions where you have a large tongue, this problem occurs like the Europeans, then lack of contact between the shelves. So the shelves should be become horizontal, comes and meet together and fuse together. And then even after fusion, they can be a rupture. So then again, you get a cleft. Those are the four main ways. There are multiple other ways as well. So we will just move into the treatment. So the individuals of the cleft of the lip or palate are unique because there are many uh, uniquenesses are there. Complete or incomplete cleft that may be isolated to the lip or palate. It may be bilateral, it may be unilateral, it may be wide or narrow. They may be syndromic or in syndrome. In addition, there may be other developmental deficits like cardiac, neurological and renal. So the long-term studies are not very difficult due to several reasons. Firstly, heterogeneity of the cleft population make finding two similar groups is very difficult. Third, secondly, the difficulty in coordinating and compiling the multi-center data is again very difficult. Finally, final result of the surgical intervention not being seen approximately two decades. For an example, if you are a surgeon, if you operate today, the final results will be there to see after 20 years. By that time, you may be not there in service. For me, if I operate now, I want to see their final results in 20 years' time. Therefore, making the high-level outcome research with long-term reliable results are very difficult. But in a treatment wise, uh, there are several groups uh, came up with uh, different uh, strategies for standard treatment uh, strategies. There are... Uh, yes. Uh, different strategies. So the CSAC, known as a clinical standard advisory group in UK in 2002, came up with a treatment plan for the cleft lip and palate. Similarly, American Cleft uh, Palate Cranial Facial Association again put forward the parameters for evaluation treatment of the cleft patient with the cleft lip and palate and the other anomalies. In addition to that, there are so many other, other people came up with the proper uh, different protocols and then finally uh, recommendation for the optimum care of the patient with a cleft lip and palate can be considered management of the patient with a cleft lip o and o palate is best provided by the by a multidisciplinary team of specialists secondly the standardizing the treatment protocols is very important so you follow the same procedure same technique okay. Can we have the MCQ for some yes. of you? Yes, we can. So the question is online. Yeah. Again, very simple question. I don't think you need 10 seconds to answer this question, so we will. Can we get the answers? Yes, sir. Results are on the screen. Yeah. Yes, Again, everybody knows. So I think you know everything about the cleft. 97% says correct. Okay. 
So there is standard treatment protocol. There are different protocols, but basically the, this one is uh, standardized and used in many parts of the world. Firstly, the prenatal diagnosis by ultrasonography. It's very important if you diagnose it prenatally, then you can do the counseling and parental education beforehand. Otherwise, uh, when you get the baby with the cliff, it's an unbearable shock for the parents as well as other people. Then after birth, primary screening is very important. Again, you get a parental education and feeding management with the feeding instructions, so many other problems. And pre-surgical orthopedics, we will discuss them in detail, but uh, usually only if necessary, and lip surgery around three months, palate surgery around nine months, then have a speech and language therapy course, uh, training uh, speech and language therapy for the baby, ENT examination and revisional surgery if necessary, such as fistula correction, uh, lip scar correction, etc. Then the alveolar bone graft around nine years, then the proper orthodontic around 11 to 13 years. And finally, once the growth is complete, osteotomy and rhinoplasty and other final surgeries. And then to perform all those, you need a multidisciplinary teams of specialists. Firstly, the pediatrician will look after the baby and so many other things. An anesthesiologist, cleft surgeon. Cleft surgeon can be a maxillo trained maxillofacial surgeon or the plastic surgeon or ENT surgeon or the pediatric surgeon who has undergone special training on cliff flip and tail. And then the speech and language therapist, pediodontist, orthodontist, ENT surgeon, OMF surgeon, prostodontist, psychiatrist, geneticist, nursing officer usually acting as a coordinator. So these are the picture of a multidisciplinary joint clinic at the University of Peradeniya. There are another uh, pictures of a multidisciplinary joint clinic. You can see Mr. Brian Samalan, one of the leading cliff surgeon in the world, and here you can see Asok Amratung, pioneer cliff surgeon in Sri Lanka, who has done more than, I think, 10,000 cases by now. And he's, she's uh, Dr. Debbie Sell, one of the renowned speech therapists, and you can see first article uh, about the Rondis of and all other people. And pre-surgical orthopedics, we just uh, go through it. There are limitations when you are discussing pre-surgical orthopedics. Firstly, the age, cooperativeness, cooperative parents, which is very important because you can do only 50%, rest of the thing has to be handled by the parents. And uh, for the pre-surgical orthopedic, you need regular visit, which means if you are in a very far distance, you are not able to come for the clinics, it's difficult to I mean, do the pre-surgical orthopedics. And finally, it's a labor intensive uh, procedure. So very busy clinic, if you are not geared for that, it's very difficult to do. And three questions when you should ask regarding the pre-surgical orthopedics. Firstly, when to start? Secondly, for unilateral cleft or bilateral cleft? Then thirdly, type of appliance which can be used. We will answer them each question separately. Firstly, when to start? Answer is as early as possible, preferably around one month. Why? It has been shown up to six weeks of life. There are high levels of maternal estrogen in the fetal circulation, which triggers an increase in the hyaluronic acid. This hyaluronic acid alters the cartilage, ligament, and connective tissue elasticity by breaking down the intercellular matrix. So, level of this estrogen start to drop at six weeks of age. It is on this principle the concept of pre-surgical orthopedics works. So if you don't start early, the results will be very poor. So, and then there are some studies showing that young infants underwent pre-surgical orthopedic around one month and then the second group, one to five months, first group shows better results than the second group. There are people uh, complaining that pre-surgical orthopedics are not working. This may be due to that, those reasons. If you don't uh, start early, then the results will be poor. And then, second question, pre-surgical orthopedics for the unilateral or bilateral? For the unilateral, effectiveness of the pre-surgical orthopedic in unilateral cleft lip is not, cleft lip and palate is not fully established. Most importantly, 
acceptable results can be obtained without pre-surgical orthopedic in unilateral lip with or without cleft palate. In addition, cost effectiveness, patients, patients compliance, availability of the skilled manpower are the main problem faced by the many cleft centers. So in our center, we don't uh, perform pre-surgical orthopedic of any form for the unilateral cleft. And, but there's a role in the pre-surgical orthopedic in the bilateral cleft. So what are the types of uh, pre-surgical orthopedic which can be used in the bilateral cleft? There are four types. Pressure tapes on a prolabium with or without intraoral plates. Then intraoral fixation devices like latham device. Deep addition, this is a surgical addition. And finally, the nasal moldings. We don't perform second and third options because they are sort of uh, not usually, it's not, uh, how can I say? Actually, they, they involve a lot of uh, torturing. We, we think it's a lot of torturing for the baby, so we don't use intraoral fixation devices and deep additions. Surgical taping and the nasal molding is practiced in our center. So, this is a strapping, elastic strapping. Again, elastic strapping for the bilateral case, prominent bilateral. Again, pre surgical orthopedic with the feeding plate, elastic traction, and the feeding plate. So, this is pre operative, and this is the final result after surgery. And this patient again, elastic traction after surgery. But we do have a problem with using this elastic traction uh, vigorously. The mobilization of pre-maxilla downward and inward can take place. So the severe displacement of the pre-maxillary segment, which is very difficult to correct orthodontically or surgically. And it's called, it can cause because of the excessive tension of the suture line, the suture breakdown is common thing. So these are the things what can happen. So imagine this patient starting from the point end up here. So this is a orthodontist and surgeon's dilemma. You can't correct this. So, so it's very, very difficult to correct this orthodontically as well as surgically. It's very difficult. So anyway, our surgeons were able to handle this patient correctly. I think this was article of patient. He has done this properly. And so they had said that the premaxilla, but uh, it's not always a very easy thing to do. So then comes the nasal lila molding. Started in our center in 2009, but we do only in selected cases. It has uh, three main devices intraoral component, the semblance of the danger, sorry, and then the intranasal component with the nasal stent and retention buttons to re retain this uh, plants in the position like here. So what happens in the uh, nasal lila molding? Firstly, these uh, pre-operative pre-nasal lila molding patient, stage one, you can see the pre is getting out into one side as well as for potato. So the first step, you straighten up the displaced pre -maxilla. And then the second step, you push it in into correct position. And what you can see, a thing of the nasal septum here, which may have to correct later. So this is the final results of nasal molding. So this is a pre nam the patient under the nasal molding, and then this is the post nam pre and post nam And then we will go through the uh, surgical procedures now, unilateral lip we prepare firstly. This is a normal lip. So everybody wants to have a lip like this, and this is a musculature, and this is the cleft. So if you can at least uh, mimic this appearance here, so then you have achieved a bit. Unilateral cleft deformity have several problems. Firstly, the maxillary and the palatal bone, bony cleft, you can see it here, maxillary and the palatal cleft. And then disruption of the ovicular splinter, tilted tripoid nasal deformity here, tilted tripoid, and deficiency of tissue, tissue deficiencies. So this has to be corrected in a proper surgery. 
So this is how we perform surgery. This is a surgeon's view. This is how the patient, surgeon sees the patient on the operation table. We go through it, so initially the marking of the lips, and then proper marking, and then dissection. This we are doing the former and flat as well. From there to there. And then Macomb close rhinoplasty to release the cartilages of the nose from both sides. We enter the resurfacing from both sides and finally suturing with the proper white roll, proper alignment, with muscle alignment as well as the skin alignment properly. So this is the pre-operative and this is the post-operative. We will go through some cases immediately. This three years after surgery. Again, one of the one of my patients who is 18 years now. So I am lucky to see at least few patients which I operated 18 years back. And then we will move into the bilateral care flip. Again, a, a clinical presentation may be from a simple a microform cleft to complete cleft bilaterally involving the lip, alveolus, palate, and the nose. So these are the different form of presentations. So by bilateral cleft lip deformity, main problems, protrusive premaxilla as you see here, maxillary collapse, when the premaxilla is protruded, maxillary arches get collapsed inside, and then short or absence columella, and deficient central lip component, which is usually lacking of any muscle. So the ideal bilateral lip repair should produce symmetrical shape, nostrils, nasals, and the ala base, adequate columnar length, a well-defined filtral dimple and columns, a natural appearing cubic bow with sprouts to the vermilion tubicle and adequate labial sulcus, lip scar approximating the natural lamma, which is very important. Then functional muscle repair that in function mimic the normal lip. So the key difference between the treatment of unilateral versus bilateral cleft lip centered around the concept of aligning three maxillary segment. There you have a two lateral segment and then prolabial segment. So aligning them in a proper way is the key problem, key difference between the bilateral and unilateral. Again, patient, previous patient who has undergone uh, NAM or cellular molding. This, is, this patient is ready for surgery now. So this is again NAM pre and post. And this is how you do modified Malikan technique. And this is pre-operative, post-operative after three years. Again, pre-operative, post-operative eight years. In four years, and it is this patient underwent in an immediate after surgery, sometimes after, and final results. So, uh, doing bilateral cleft flip and palate is a, a challenging uh, thing for the surgeon, and I think uh, if you can achieve good results, that's a, a real achievement. So the cleft palate, as you can see in this diagram, the muscle displacement is severe here, especially the levator palate as well as the tensor palate and other muscles were displaced in the midline cleft. And we have the MCQ5 Sumudu? Sumudu? Ah, yes, sir, yes. I'm launching the MCQ5, sir. Yeah. So this again a very simple question. Which of the following muscles is typically reoriented during the cleft palate repair? There are five answers. Shall I have the polls now? Yes. So results are on the screen. Yes, again, 76% of them got it correct. So, okay, thank you. 
So the objective of the cleft palate repair threefold. Firstly, to produce the anatomical closure of the defect, which is important. And then they create an apparatus for development and produce the normal speech. So this is again important. That is the basic thing for the cleft palate repair. Then, in addition to that, the important thing to minim minimize the maxillary growth disturbance and the entire lunar deformity. So if you can achieve all these three, then that is very fine. So usually the palate surgery should be performed in the magnification. You can either use loops or you can use the operating microscope if available. Sorry. This is the initial uh, marking of the cleft palate for surgery. And this is the intermediate stage where you can see, see the levator properly mobilized into the midline and suture, pre-orientating the muscles and the final. And then after, let mistake here, after, yes, being here, after uh, that surgery, usually we start the speed therapy. But uh, one should remember before, before uh, palate surgery also, we have to have uh, some uh, therapies involved. Uh, improper interaction, with, uh, in, improved interaction between the mother and child has to be done beforehand. Encourage the bubbling to prevent the backing. Improve the cognitive and language skills, which can be done even before surgery. Usually after surgery, after one month, so when the wounds are properly healed, first improve the bubbling child will try to imitate the lip movement and then train to make sounds with lips. Then follow up initially for three months and one has to be remember speech problems can reappear at puberty due to receding adenoids because if the palate is short the adenoids itself acting as a, a sort of a dam in the posterior part but with the receding adenoids you can have a speech problem appearing again. So assessment of neuropharyngeal incompetence in EPI, two methods, direct, that is instrumental, and then indirect. This is a video, nasopharyngeal. We are using the nasal endoscope to check the palatal movement. You can see some defect in the palate here. Soft palate, pharyngeal wall, and the soft palate, there's some defect, different type of defect. So there is a commonly used uh, instruments to do that. In addition to that, lateral video fluoroscopy, nasometry and other things are used. And if needed, secondary surgery, we need to improve the uh, speech, pharyngeal flaps, but they are not very physiological. Heinz pharyngeoplasty, double flap on the posterior pharyngeal wall to create a bulge. Here. Again, not very physiological, and some people has use a box made of lab to lengthen the palate. That shows some improvement, and then different uh, uh, modalities, like fat injection, assessment of this. And then with the assessment of the speech, we'll indicate the management. And then briefly about hearing. The hearing uh, is one of the problems which you can get in a fit and palate patient mainly due to failure of the use taking tube to ventilate the middle ear, which lead uh, middle ear effusion. Of course, the use taking tube is shorter and not patent. And then the abnormal insertion of the tensor really muscle in the tube cartilage. And then again, lateral lamina of the cartilage is poorly developed. So you get hearing problems such as otitis media, tympanic membrane dysfunction, perforations, cholestoma, etc. So problems basically do here, mid-ear inf infection, impaired the function of the tympanic membrane, and defective neurological functions can be found. However, with proper treatment of the ear infection and periodical hearing evaluation, the incidence of hearing loss has significantly reduced. So the management of hearing loss, three main areas, the chromat insertion, hearing aids, and sometimes if necessary cochlear implant, which is very expensive modality. So the, then, then we move into the very important area, dental care for the children with a left with dental. Why? 
poor lighting. Why poor lighting? The man look, sorry. Man look closer, deform and hypoplastic teeth. Frequent treatment has lead to poor patient compliance for the maintaining of the oral hygiene. Pampering at home due to the gift so by the parents or the other people. So that usually pampering in our, our countries they done by providing chocolates, etc., which will increase the sugar intake of the baby. And then the frequent surgical episodes during which oral hygiene is not maintained. And then the, there's a psychological aspect as well. So because of that, you get a poor oral hygiene. And then in the mixed dentition, there are some dental problems as well. So missing permanent teeth, supernumerary teeth may be there. Teeth of abdominal morphology, hyperplastic teeth, then the delayed or abnormal eruptions, retardation of growth of maxilla leading to class three malocclusion, then the mobile premaxilla, especially in the bilateral cases. Then to oral hygiene and periodontal problem. Those are the main problems you see in the mixed dentition. So the dentist has essential role. The dentist has an essential role in giving early prevention advice for the young children with cleft lip and palate. Parents are helped to focus the importance of good oral hygiene for their child. This is very important. Advice on weaning practice and dentally safe food. Uh, and drinks is important. Particular attention should be given to the tooth brushing in the cleft region, not only that, rest of the mouth as well. The reassurance regarding the variable dental development in the cleft area should be considered. And then we will move to the next uh, next option, uh, next treatment, the allular bone graft. Allular bone graft basically can be divided into three main groups primary, intermediate, and secondary. We are mainly concerning about the intermediate group here. Uh, it is done shortly before the maxilla, eruption of the maxillary canal. As you know, I think all of you are dental surgeons. You need a, a bone, a alveolar bone, for tooth erupt. So, in a cleft patient, there is a bony defect. So, when you put the bone, you get a closure of that maxillary defect, bone defect. So, actually, the alveolar bone graft is used to eliminate the residual alveolar defect in the patient with a cleft lip and palate. The priority alveolar bone graft, short period of orthodontic, about six months often needed, usually to create the space for placement of bony inside of the alveolar cleft alveolar. Then you might get correct uh, insights across by which has to be corrected beforehand. And then finally expand the collapse lateral segments, especially in the bilateral cases, before in the bone graft. Procedure, the medieval bone from distant site, iliac crest is the most commonly used site. Tibia, mandibular symphysis, cranium can be used as a size sites to obtain the cancerous bone. The aim of the alleal bone graft basically sixfold facilitate, facilitate the eruption of permanent canine. Then it provides the bony support to the adjacent teeth, stabilizes the cleft segment, especially in the bilateral cases. Then it facilitates the fistula closure. So, and it improves the uh, contour of the ala base. So, when you are going for rhinoplasty, proper base is needed to get the proper alignment of the nose. And then it minimizes the prosthetic treatment later. So, if you have a, you can go for other options like implant. With three months of successive surgery, graft should be indistinguishable radiologically from the normal bone, and it should be clinically as a normal alveolar bone. To, ex, uh, act, to assess the success of the bone graft, simplest way is a postoperative x ray, usually taken two weeks, one year annually thereafter. For some people, go for a CBCT, which is very good. But it's not available in many centers. This is the automatic way of uh, showing the alveolar bone graft. The canon is about to erupt. So you get the nasal, uh, nasal flow properly corrected and bone graft and the oral flow. This is how you do it. You put the graft and this is after alveolar bone graft. Canon is erupting now. So canon is in the position now. 
and then uh, maxillary growth. We have to now after palate surgery we have to think of maxillary growth. So cleft palate patient uh, having have scarring of the palate. Why? Amount of the scarring highly dependent on the surgical technique. There are multiple surgical techniques to correct the cleft palate, but depending on the different techniques, you get uh, scarring, excessive amount of scarring. And then amount of skeletal discrepancy depend on the scarring and genetical class through skeletal pattern. To begin with, if you have a genetical class three, the cleft uh, palate correction is that will be worse. So this actually, State and uh, this lateral case take them from the same patient at the age of 11.1, 15.1, and 16.5. Nothing has been done, just the stress. So you can see here it's a normal class 2D1 patient, and then after about five years, the patient has developed a severe class 3. So that is the growth. Actually, mandible, mandible is growing normally, but maxilla falls back. So end up with the class three. Then uh, small not about orthodontics. Orthodontics, the permanent dentition, orthodontic alone is done on adolescents, like a normal patient around 13 to 14 years, 12 to 13 actually, to do normal orthodontics. And then orthodontic in conjunction with the automatic surgery or distraction in adult. Here it's very important to have a long-term retention because uh, in cleft patients, long-term stability is questionable than the normal patient. So this is a correction of a crossbite, shall we? the correction of crossbite using that plans, and then the comprehensive orthodontics here, and the preparation of the alveolar bone graft quadrilix using this patient. Now you can get it corrected and the bone graft is placed and the completion of the treatment. Then the orthognatic surgery. Orthognatic surgery uh, in cleft fit and palate. Primary indication for consideration of orthognatic surgery in the cleft fit and palate are firstly to improve the facial aesthetics. Secondly, the creation of functional and stable occlusion. So those are the two main things why we have to do it. Orthognatic Procedures here vary considerably from that performed on a non cleft patient. In a non cleft patient, you operate on a single jaw, that means uh, maxilla in one piece. But here, it either in a two, two parts or maybe in a bilateral case, three parts. And it's then it's a part, part from a long term treatment plan for the total management. So when you are thinking of everything, has to be considered. Usually perform after growth is complete around 20 to 22 years. And this is one of the surgeries before one osteotomy correction. You can see the appearance completely changes. And then osteodistraction. Osteodistraction is a surgical procedure with before one osteotomy and distraction of the remaining the osteotomy, one osteotomy cuts only and distract the Axilla anteriorly. The protocol is one millimeter per day distraction, duration about 26 days, and you have to leave it for consultation for three months. So, this is the surgical procedure before one osteotomy. This is the pre distraction and this is the post distraction. So, this is how you get the, this uh, rapid maxilla expander designed by one of the Orthodontist who works in Kalambuna. So this is the rapid maxilla and and then uh, these are the results of uh, patient frontal view and the profile view pre and post completely changed. Again, we are able to achieve about more than ten millimeters. This is a frontal view. P and post, and P and post occlusion, and the P and post profile, and then this is P and post waiting for the rhinoplasty and the final touch up. 
So uh, finally, the important factors to remember in treating the cleft. Orofacial cleft requires multidisciplinary approach. Then treatment extends for many years and is exhausted in the patient cooperation. So need to keep the patient best interest in mind because we have to listen to the patient. We have to think and understand what the patient wants not what we want. So there is one problem, basic mistake we are doing. So we don't communicate with the patient properly and sometimes you know, after you do the surgery, the patient says he wants something else. So always talk to them. In summary, goal of the cleft care is to do more with less surgeries or less interventions. Do more with less interventions. Constructive surgery remains the standard procedure. Inductive procedures can minimize the burden, such as you know, severe displaced bilateral and carefully pen pallet, mesoalveolar molding can minimize the burden. Here the induction, mechanical induction, is the most effective at present. But people are doing studies on role of biological induction, still it remains unknown. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, wonderful lecture, sir. And, uh, Can I have one more slide, please? Yes, so, please. Uh, there's a few books uh, written by me on Facebook uh, pen palette available in English, Tamil, and Sinhala. So you can download this book from this uh, research gate site. It's free, freely available. You can get it if you want. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. So, uh, we have a few questions for you uh, from the viewers. Yeah. And uh, shall we go one by one, sir? Yeah, sure. Yes. So, we have one question from uh, Dr. Sankalp Gamage. Yeah. So, what are the main uh, protocols of cleft flip and palate management practiced in the world and their differences in general? Okay. Basically, uh, in some countries, uh, they perform, I'll start from the beginning. Some countries, they perform nasal molding for almost even unilateral cases. But, uh, but that is very, very expensive treatment option to begin with. So for an example, that will go into $1,000 if you are doing it in the USA. So and in a country like ours, it may not be practical because and then the, the manpower, which is, should be available. So nasal alveolar molding, to begin with, nasal alveolar molding is different. I think basically the feeding, feeding and the basic management is almost all same everywhere. And then the lip surgery, some people actually regarding the lip surgery, sometime back they try to do the intrauterine lip surgery as well, or lip surgery at birth. But now it is uh, the practice is abandoned due to many reasons. One thing is you can't properly get the tissues into proper alignment at that is very small child. And intrauterine uh, surgeries, not uh, there are several cases done by several surgeons, but uh, somehow it's uh, so dangerous and then results are not very good, so they abandon that. But in some countries, especially the Middle East countries, they insist of doing the lip surgery at birth. But again, as you know, the anesthetic, anesthetic risk is very high. Secondly, the alignment of the lip properly is very difficult. So that is also a problem. So the lip surgery usually I get at birth or I, I can say about more than half or 75% of the people, they do around three to six months. And then the palate surgery. Palate surgery usually regarding the core standard is about nine, six, nine months, but some people it actually goes from six months to one year. But in the Scandinavian countries, there are different uh, protocols are being practiced. So they do the soft palate first. They say that is important for the uh, speech and then hard palate around three to four years. What they say is uh, doing hard pellet at a later stage will prevent the scarring, so the growth disturbances are less. Still controversial issues. 
but regarding the alveolar bone graft and then the osteotomy, sinoplasty is, I think, uh, almost everywhere. It's uh, that standard age, and those things are similar. And then again, speed therapy and the hearing usually done at the same. Is that okay? Yes, sir. thank you very much, sir. Uh, that's a comprehensive answer. Sir, uh, we have one uh, question from Dr. Chandira Gunasena. Yeah. Uh, how are the impressions taken to fabricate feeding plates in cleft palate infants? Yes, that is a, a, another problem. In our setup, actually, uh, you have to have, uh, you have to use the rubber base impression. You can't use alginate, so it's very, very dangerous to use the alginate impression to take the impression. Rubber base impression has to be taken, has to be used, and then if possible, under gas anesthesia, then you have a full control. But provided that you have adequate facilities to do that, you can do that. But if not, it's very difficult to take the impression of a very young child. I know it's a real problem, but under gas anesthesia with a rubber based impression, you can do it. So, say for an example, if you are going for an SLL molding, you need, you need to have a very good impressions. So, that problem starts from that point onwards. So, Ideally speaking, it should be rubber based impression taken okay. under anesthesia. Okay, uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, sir, we have a question from uh, anonymous attendee. Uh, sir, is yeah. there any role of hormone therapy after cleft lip and palate surgery? Uh, hormone therapy, of course, uh, not. Uh, there are some experimental studies, but not well established. But uh, there are some uh, therapies they use to reduce the scarring actually, injecting corticosteroid because uh, as you know, all the patients are not the same. Some, pe some people tend to form keloids after surgery, hip surgery. Okay. In those patients, those uh, steroids and the plants, there are some scar, scar, scar X like uh, scar reducing agents. So those things may have some effect on a a patient who have uh, keloids, but I think uh, very important, uh, not only the scarring, the surgical technique and tissue handling is very important. So with that you can control it, but even with that you have a scarring, so then you can use the uh, steroids and the anti-scar uh, creams, etc. But hormones uh, still on an experimental basis, so it might come up in the future, but not at the moment. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, sir, we have a question from Dr. R. Sai. Uh, now, he's, uh, his question is, uh, please uh, throw some light on warmerine flaps. Okay, so I didn't touch upon the warmerine flap. So actually, if you see the lip surgery, warmerine flap are done at the same time. Uh, doing warmerine flap is very important and very good. There are some long, long. Uh, I think uh, if you go to the literature, there are some long-standing studies. One is uh, uh, published by Mr. Brian Samalad. It says he says uh, there's no the main against for main main school of thoughts against the warmer flap is saying that it growth it reduced the maxillary growth or maxillary growth retardation is induced by the warmer flap. So that study shows there is no such a thing. It's a comparison study, so it shows uh, warmer and flap won't co won't cause the maxillary growth retardation. Actually, its advantages are there. So when you are doing the warmer and flap, you are creating a nasal flow. So when you are going for alveolar bone graft, it's very easy, and the na nasal flow is created at the lip surgery itself. So it's very easy for the surgeon to perform a little bone graft later, and it's very easy for the patient and comfortable for the patient to have a nasal flow. Regurgitations, foods will be minimized with that. Okay, uh, thank you very much, sir. We have another question from Dr. Aruna Vimala Ratna. Yeah. Uh, sir, is there any possibility to place the dental implants or bone augmentation procedure in the cliff palate surgical site? at the later age to replace the two teeth as improvement of aesthetics of the patient. Definitely. There's a, a real, real, 
actually real use of implant in the cleft page patients uh, because even after allula bone graft you need something to be there to hold the allula bone either you need to or you can put an implant that is perfectly all right because that will be a permanent uh, solution for the defect because the cleft patients are usually comes with the missing teeth etc so implant has a big role if the patient or if we can provide it properly thank you very much sir uh, we have another question from uh, dr anushan jay singh huh? yes. um, uh, great lecture sir please let us know about post op management of lip and palate patients feeding immediately after repair use of antibiotics and tranexamic acid uh, evidence for use so <laughs> so that is another lecture anushan lecture. <laughs> i will summarize it so the tranexamic acid use of tranexamic acid uh, intraoperatively we, we are practicing it uh, almost i think more than 10 years now uh, it's actually 10 mg per kg body weight given during the anesthesia and then we have noticed it reduced the post operative as well as intraoperatively bleeding drastically and then uh, feeding of course once the patient is fully recovered Uh, some people even in west western countries they feed the patient in the theater itself but here our setup usually in a normal patient you wait wait for 6 hours before patient fully recover but it's not so for the cleft you need don't need to wait for 6 hours what we have to do is we have to have a, a smooth recovery so sometimes patient start crying because of the hunger so then you can feed uh, immediately once they recover the some sometimes we can immediately after patient sent to the ward we can ask the mother to feed so and the antibiotic of course uh, again uh, standard practice what we are doing is we are use, using amoxicillin or augmentin for all the post operative cases but still that is controversial whether those antibiotics what you are giving is effective so at the moment we are conducting a study to see uh, organisms in the cleft lip and palate Uh, pre-operatively, uh, we are taking samples from the uh, operation table itself and checking for the antibiotic sensitivity test and whether what we are giving is actually a real value. Okay. So, uh, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Yes, uh, sir. Uh, we have another question from uh, Dr. Nuwan Rajabaksa. Yeah. Uh, uh, sir, could you please elaborate on assessment of velopharyngeal insufficiency in detail? Yes, actually, velopharyngeal insufficiency. Basically, uh, as I told you, it's uh, instrumental as well as the uh, sort of uh, uh, objective assessment. Objective assessment means the speech therapist will assess the patient for different uh, uh, verbal assessment, and then the that is most important. So, instrument itself is not adequate. So, I am not competent. In, in detail to give how you do it but i know the speech therapist can finally diagnose because we really that problem here is the soft palate is not touching the posterior part of the pharynx and making a proper closure so if there's a air leak then you have to check where it is if the palate is not properly moving then you can use the lateral video fluoroscopy to see the movement of the palate but even sometimes the lateral video fluoroscopy completely looks normal but still patient is having some problem and then you can check for the nasal endoscope and to see that whether you get a, a complete closure i think if you can remember when i show in the nasal endoscope i show some uh, different type of closure so in those closures you can see lateral escapes and midline escape etc so those has to be correct but uh, in a, in addition to that there are other uh, mechanical or the instruments like an ES esometry etc so with those uh, you should be able to go for the a diagnosis of the velopharyngeal insufficiency is that okay yes sir thank you uh, so we have another question from uh, dr sarkar uh, yeah. what are the cases when we can go for lip revision surgeries lip revision surgery depends on the what you get with lip revision usually if you see that very ugly scar the vermilion borders are not mismatched and then the white lines are displaced and then lip is totally distorted and then 
uh, first first thing we are one important thing we should check without uh, when you, you look at the lip it may be looks uh, normal but when you ask the patient to do the different movements pursing of the lip you can see the muscles are not properly joined together so in that case definitely we have to go for a muscle repair and then the proper skin and the vermilion border proper closure especially the white line okay uh, thank you very much sir so we have another question uh, from an anonymous attendee uh, yeah. sir so what what is the submucous uh, cleft palate okay so he wants to know what is so he wants to know the treatment of submucous uh, so that's the question uh, can we have a brief uh, yeah. brief okay. outline sir please? submucous cleft is the cleft where you can i didn't touch that because there's no time uh, submucous cleft is a cleft there you get a muscle separation so you have a nasal mucosa you have oral mucosa but in the middle you don't get a muscle so to diagnose it uh, if you if you open, ask the patient to open the mouth you can see the bluish line in the middle and then if you palpate it uh, posterior nasal spine is bifid so if you palpate it you can easily identify but one problem with the submucous cleft some of the submucous cleft patients are completely normal their speech is normal no regurgitation nothing so don't touch of those patients because it, the chances of submucous cleft are not very easy to repair it's very very difficult cleft to repair because lack of tissue so it's the chances are of getting uh, fistulas very high sometimes it goes up to 25% one fourth of the submucous repairs end up with a fistula but the problem the parents will tell you our baby doesn't have a cleft before or any hole in the palate beforehand but after your surgery he develop a fistula or a hole so that is very difficult and therefore if face obviously not indicated don't do go for a submucous cleft the main indication for surgery is uh, we have to check with your speech therapist if the speech therapist says correction of uh, palate submucous palate will help the speech of course go ahead with the surgery and then the second thing very rarely happens regurgitation if that happens then go ahead with surgery otherwise don't touch the submucous cleft Okay. Thank you very much, sir. So we have another question from uh, Dr. Chandira. Uh, are lipids in uh, Van der Wood syndrome being treated surgically or left behind? Pardon me? Uh, lipids in uh, lipids in Van der Wood yeah. syndrome can be treated surgically or left behind. It has to be corrected. It has to be surgically corrected. But one one thing you have to remember, it's not easy thing to do because uh, lipids actually they are a pointing of the salivary gland. So if you just just do the superficial dissection you will end up with leaving some salivary gland behind so best way to do it is you add some dye and let the gland to take up the dye and dissect all the stain part out so then there are way there are for there are way that way you can complete take out the salivary gland which is causing the lipid okay uh, thank you very much sir it was so much uh, dominant it was so yes. much dominant if you see yes. that you can see the mother definitely you get a whole series of patients yes uh, uh, thank you very much sir uh, so that concludes uh, the session and once again uh, let me apologize uh, for the inconvenience caused uh, due to the technical error and uh, and thank you very much everyone for staying connected and hope uh, you had you had a fruitful session let me once again thank uh, dr parakram vijay kon sir for your valuable contribution uh, to this session and uh, a kind reminder before we wind up uh, at the end of this webinar uh, you will you will you will receive an email please uh, follow the link and submit your feedback uh, for further improvements uh, thank you very much and have a good night thank you thank you everybody have a good night